Okay, good afternoon and welcome back everyone to our options education webinar series. My name is Tony Zhang. I'm the Chief Strategy Officer and I am joined once again by Jessica Inskip, our Director of Education and Product. And today we're here to talk about a strategy that is very much widely used by not only traders here at Options Play, but I think many of you watching today, today which are debit vertical spreads. So this is a strategy that has a very specific use case for the markets, predominantly when you have a directional view. So we're going to discuss not only when do you generally use these debit vertical spreads, but more importantly, the best practices around them. So Jess will be walking you through a deep dive of the individual strategy, use cases of when you can utilize them, and understanding the risks and rewards for these types of trades. And I will jump in that towards the very end and discuss managing these trades. How do you go about putting on them and deciding when to close out these trades? So with that, let's go ahead and get started. And with that, I will hand this over to Jess to kick things off. And we will have a discussion around best practices of using debit spreads in this market environment that we have today. Thank you, Tony. All right, so to kick it off, as per usual, let's start with an important disclaimer. Um, types of securities forms and research tools used in this video are for demonstration purposes only and should not be considered a recommendation by options play or solicitation or an offer to buy or sell any securities. This video is not intended for individual tax, legal, or investment planning advice. All right. So we're going to cover today um, some of the prerequisites for this, which we're, we're going to cover and make sure you know the facts for it, or just understanding calls and puts and some of the Greeks, we're going to talk about that a, lit, a, a little bit, but I want to make sure we go over the basics of that. So we're going to cover that. Then we'll get into bullish strategies, specifically call debit spreads or vertical call spreads. They have a, certainly have quite a bit of names, these strategies. Then we'll get into the bearish strategies, trade management, as well as exercise and assignment risks and save time for Q&A at the end as well. But the main question that we're going to answer throughout this webinar is how can I improve my probability of success and lower my risk with debit vertical spreads? So let's start with a quick review of, of just the long calls and the long puts. That's what we're going to focus on today. And the way that I really love to teach um, really option strategies when you get into multi-legs multi is utilizing a strategy driver, meaning there is some leg that is more expensive that is going to be the main component of that strategy. And this chart really helps understand that and put that into perspective. And we can build on this in time as I, as I love to do throughout this series. But long calls and long puts are what we're going to focus on today. When we have a vertical debit spread, so something that we're buying, they're the strategy. That's the driver of these strategies because these are the options that we purchase. We purchase the long call for the right to buy something. So therefore we're bullish. That's why we're on this quadrant. And for the put side, we purchase the long put with the right to sell something at a predefined price within a strike price. And so we own those rights. Those are long positions. These are the drivers and the purpose of um, a vertical spread is really to cap potential. And we'll go into that in more detail, but we are going to focus on long calls, but the purpose of always showing you this screen is it's just a mirror image. So once you understand the long calls or the vertical call spreads in this case, you can actually mirror it across to the long put side. And then real quick on the Greeks, this is something we built on before. And if you wanna really dive into the Greeks, we, we have a whole hour on our YouTube channel and our education resources where we really go into the depth of the Greeks. But what you need to know today and just give you the, the quick little brief overview is the goals that are associated with these long positions that are subsequent responses from the Greeks themselves. So a long call is purchased for a premium, you have a right to buy, therefore time decay is negative and you profit from Sharpe's upwards movement, which means it's as a positive delta because it's a bullish position. So we're gonna look at that, that's important. Um, gamma is something that tells us the acceleration of delta. So a higher gamma means a, a higher movement upwards. And that's something that's true for long positions. This is gonna have a negative delta because it profits from downward movement. Um, those are what I want you to take into account today. 
theta is also negative for both of these because time decay does not benefit long positions. We want them to go up in value, not down in value. And time is something that's working against us. So those are the Greeks that I just want you to keep in your mind. And, and this is really kind of at the core of why, you know, we want to learn about debit spreads. Um, because when you look at just long calls and long puts or just long call, uh, short calls and short puts, they're kind of at extremes in terms of their pros and cons. You have benefits to being long calls or puts, which is predominantly the fact that you have limited risk. Um, and you have this unlimited reward, this asymmetrical risk profile that capt captivates a lot of investors, right? You, you want leverage if you're right, and you want to have limited risk to the downside. That's kind of the best of both worlds. But it comes with one major trade-off, and that's time decay, that theta uh, Greek that we're referring to. So when you're buying a long call or put, that's a downside. So on the flip side, if you're short a call or a put, you have positive theta, right? So time decay is working in your favor, which sounds great, but you have negative gamma, which is um, the asymmetrical risk reward ratio works against you. You have limited reward with unlimited risk. And generally speaking, you don't want to have to choose between either two of these extremes. And debit spreads really allow you to mel uh, uh, merge these two worlds into a strategy that kind of gives you a, a bit of best of both worlds. So today, this is really kind of where if you're brand new to debit spreads, the goal here is so that you don't have to choose between one of these two extremes. You can have something that's more in the middle. And that's predominantly why vertical spreads, whether you trade them at a debit, which is the ones that we're going to display here today and talk about today, or at a credit for credit vertical spreads, these two types of vertical spreads are the ones that we predominantly use in the daily plays that we send out to you every single day. It's because it gives you a best of both worlds to some degree. So before we jump into these strategies themselves, I do want to launch a quick poll here. I want to get a sense for how many of you have traded a debit vertical spread here today. I'm curious, how many of you are familiar with the strategy and traded it? How many of you are brand new and learning? Um, and if some of you are not sure, if you're not familiar with the terminology of a debit vertical spread, you might be more familiar with a bull call spread or a bear put spread. Um, there are different variations that sometimes these names are, uh, these strategies are called. Okay, so it looks like three quarters of you have traded a debit spread before. Um, and I think for many of you that are, that have been Options Play subscribers or members, you're familiar with it because we trade a lot of them with our daily plays. 16% of you say that you have not traded it. So hopefully today is a learning experience and shows you why debit and ver um, debit vertical spreads are used very heavily in our work here at Options Play. And for the 9% of you, if you're not sure, hopefully you'll learn some more uh, about these strategies here today. So perfect, we see. <coughs> I see a lot of you have already answered that. So thank you so much. Um, and that helps us frame the conversation here for today. So Jess, take it away. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so let's dive right into the basics and mechanics of it. And this is for those people who have never done it before. Or just a quick reminder for those who have, um, like I said, the way that I love to describe all option strategies is with their driver. And that goes all the way to four-legged option strategies. They're just an extension of something that's a core component. And you're either capping risk, or excuse me, capping your upwards or downwards potential, or you're mitigating risk of some sort. Um, so with the case of debit vertical spreads, you're actually capping potential. So for a long call, and the example I have, and I, I pulled these prices uh, yesterday, so probably just changed a little bit. So I apologize for that. I try to keep them as up to date as possible for you. But for a long call, if you were just to purchase one Apple 150 strike 30 day days till expiration call for $5, you're gonna risk $500. Your reward is unlimited upwards potential. So your goal is you want that stock to go up as much as possible. You don't care how much you, you literally need it to go up as much as possible. Is that realistic? Not necessarily. And that's why there's other things that you can utilize in tandem to understand price targets, especially with this type of environment, understanding the next resistant zone or, or things of that nature will help you understand your price target. But from the long call perspective, you're buying a decaying asset and you're going to benefit from strong upwards directional movement. In this case, this 150 is considered at the money. 
So Apple was at 150 when this price was taken, which means this entire $5 premium is made up of extrinsic value, which is going to decay as we near expiration, which is why we need Apple at expiration, at least at minimum, to move more than that extrinsic value purchased. And that's that, that theta decay that we were talking about. That's why long options have a negative theta because this is going to decay. If I was short that option, that would certainly benefit me, but I'm not, I'm long this option. Therefore I need to overcome that time value that I purchased. I need it to go above 155 at expiration if it does it before because of that. And you can still make some money. That's why price targets are important and exit strategies, which we will talk about. But either way, I need unlim I have unlimited gain potential, but I need a strong directional movement for Apple. Now, if I utilize technical analysis or price targets from an analyst or whatever my process is, and perhaps I say, you know, I, I see this resistance at 160. I don't, full disclosure, that is not where I see resistance of Apple right now. Um, but, and if it's, and that's where you perhaps feel that your upwards potential is capped, you could sell a call at the same strike, or excuse me, same expiration, same amount of calls, just a higher strike. And that's what makes it a debit spread. This option right here is always going to be more expensive, the one that you're purchasing the strategy driver, because it's going to be a lower strike. And a lower strike on the call side means you have a right to buy at a lower price than this higher one. That's why it's called a debit spread because you purchase this for a debit and that's where it gets its name from. And it's vertical because we're moving from directional movement here and it's a call vertical debit spread. So there's some reasons why it gets its name. Um, nonetheless, when I cap my upwards potential, I can reduce my risk by selling a call against those calls. So that's an offsetting position. Now my risk is 340. I don't have unlimited reward potential, but I confidently feel that Apple is going to resist at 160. So I'm comfortable with exiting that position or if Apple goes above that, then I'll, I'll address from there, which we'll talk about with portfolio management or position management a little later on. But I've reduced my reward, but I've also reduced my risk. My goal is still strong upwards potential, but I've also reduced the break-even price as well, which is a good way of describing of when I would be profitable and things of that nature. And, I've, and what I've essentially done, another way of saying reducing my risk is I've reduced that extrinsic value component that I've purchased that's going to decay and work against me in exchange for capped upwards potential. Yeah, and I think a, a good way to think about this is, you know, the strategy on the left-hand side that you see the call option, you're paying for that unlimited gain. And if you don't think the stock is going to reach 165, 170, 180 by your 30-day expiration date, why should you pay for all that upside? Because you are paying for that upside in that extrinsic value. Even though that's a low probability, you are paying for it. So what you are effectively doing is not only are you buying the option at 150, you're basically saying, I'll sell some options at a higher price because I don't think the stock is going to reach that specific price or go higher. And in exchange for that, you're basically collecting some income that's going to reduce your risk. And it's actually going to improve your risk reward ratio. And that's exactly what we're going to look at here today is looking at how do you improve your risk reward ratio? Because when you reduce your risk on the overall trade, you're going to, even if the stock makes the same move, you're going to have a higher return on capital because you've simply now committed only $340 to the trade rather than $500. So that's the net effect that you get with the debit spread, kind of, again, the best of both worlds. Hey, I hope that you're enjoying the session so far. I would love for you to join me on my next live event, where you can learn alongside thousands of traders, and I'll answer your questions live. Either click on the link on your screen or check out the description below. I host weekly trading and education sessions just like this one, and you'll get to trade alongside our research team's daily trading signals, weekly technical research, and access the most intuitive option strategies analytics platform free for 30 days. We're here to help you succeed, and please make sure you like this video and hit the subscribe button. Thank you, and let's get back to it. So when we think about a debit vertical spread, 
um, you know, now that we've talked about the concept of buying, you know, in, in just uh, in the previous slide, the case that Jess showed you the 150 uh, strike and then selling the 160 strike, whenever you're looking at a specific stock, the question is, how do you choose which strike price you buy and which strike price you sell? Now, before we get into the strike prices, I do want to get a sense for how you want to think about choosing expiration dates. So I have a poll here again. What expiration date would you choose when you're trading a debit vertical spread? And for those of you that have not traded a vertical spread here before, you can answer based on what you would typically buy a long call or long put. with. Um, would you buy uh, a long call or put that expires less than 10 days between 10 and 30, 30 to 60, or more than 60? Okay, so far, at least half of you have answered and two thirds of you have said 30 to 60 days. 22% or almost a quarter of you say 10 to 30 days. Very few of you said less than 10 and very few of you said more than 60. So about two thirds of you have answered this at this point. And I think that's a pretty good representation here. And this certainly seems to align with um, you know, what we consider as market best practices, which is usually going about 30 to 60 days for a debit vertical spread, or even if you're just long a call or a put using that 30 to 60 day window. And the reason that we use that 30 to 60 day window has to do with the time decay factor that we discussed in the first couple of slides. If you choose an expiration date that expires in less than 10 days, um, your time decay is extremely fast in those last 10 days. So whatever you pay, the extrinsic value of that option will decay at a very fast rate per day. Now, if you go, if you use a longer dated option for the same holding period, you're going to experience significantly lower time decay. And that's part of the benefit of going longer dated. It's going to be more expensive, but the benefit is that for each day you hold on to the trade, you're going to lose less to time decay. And you're always battling time decay when you're buying or uh, when, when your driver of your strategy is a long call or a put. So that's the reason why we choose a longer dated option, you know, that 30 to 60 day. Um, but but I'm glad to see that two thirds of you are following a similar uh, process to choosing your expiration date. Now, when you're looking at your strike prices, this is really where you have a lot of different choices. So, you know, the, the best part about options play is that you can create any three strategies side by side and test things out. So here, what we've done is we've basically created a few different tests. We bought one where the first one, the strategy on the left-hand side, we basically bought an at-the-money call option. Uh, as you can see here in this particular case, Electronic Arts at the time was trading at 138. We purchased the 140, 150 call spread, basically the first out-of-the-money call option, and then selling a 150 uh, call option against it. 150 is roughly the top of the trading range we've seen in Electronic Arts over the past year or so. Um, in the middle uh, panel, what we've chosen is a 135, 150 call spread. So we're buying the first in the money option. Um, and this is going to give us a slightly higher delta on the trade, but it also has a lower extrinsic value, which Jess is gonna walk you through as to what that actually means for your strategy. And then the last one, what we're doing is the same 135, but selling the 155s against it. So we're testing out different strike prices. At this point, what I'm not going to do is talk about good or bad. The point of this exercise is to show you the different variations and kind of the different outcomes that you, you will achieve, because ultimately finding the right strike price also depends on what your views are for the underlying stock. Um, they're going to have different... Um, uh, influences on, on time decay. And that's an important factor that we're going to discuss in the differences between these three, uh, but also just your directional view. So Jess is going to walk you through the different scenarios with these three uh, 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 strategies and kind of the different outcomes, depending on whether the stock goes in the direction you expect it to and what the risks, uh, what the rewards are and what happens if the trade goes in, in the opposite direction that you expect it to and what the risks are with that. Mm -hmm. um, and the important part to take away from what you're viewing on the screen as we go through these examples, and that will be on the, 
the next screen as well when we go through the outcomes is the extrinsic value component that's purchased. So like Tony was saying, it's the strategy driver. That's something that's working against you when you are buying a call and that's the decaying asset. So what we've done is, is laid different strategies side by side. I saw a question that came in that said, what's my best risk to reward ratio? Well, this is the way that you're going to determine it is by understanding your directional movement where you feel the security is going to go in time frame as well. Um, so you're going to have the highest extrinsic value, the um, higher the option is, to be honest. Theta is centered around at the money options. So that's something important to know and things. That's why you could have a positive theta for a bull call spread, even if it's since the long call is a strategy driver, it's the way you layer your strike prices. Gamma is also centered around at the money options and so is Vega. So those are things that are momentum in a way. So th those are going to spike prices and that's something that we need to be cognizant of and I'll walk you through that as we go through these examples. But what's important to take note here is purchasing the one the uh, 140 call, that is the, about a 0.5 delta, so the closest to the money from this range or the, on the option chain. We capped our upward potential at 105. We have extrinsic value of 309 that we have to overcome. This one, we purchased deeper in the money, which means it has a higher delta. That's so that's why um, the when you have a long call, think about this back to the strategy driver. And if you're going back to that Greeks presentation and have that image in your head, we um, had a scale of how Delta is measured. And for a long call, you it, anything that's neutral is, is always at zero. So something that's closer to the money and you want it to get closer to one, that's really the goal. And when it gets closer to one, it, so the Delta values increase, that means you're profitable for a long position. So what this means is we're take a 0.62 Delta has a higher probability of being in the money because it already is. Um, but it's already slightly profitable. And when it starts moving towards those greater values or towards one, it actually loses its extrinsic value or its theta component. And so we're trying to capitalize on that. And that's why it has a lower extrinsic value that we've already calculated for you. Um, this is a similar experiment here is this is the same delta. So a 0.62 delta, so a little deeper in the money trying to take away that theta decay. We capped our upwards potential at 155, but we actually ended up paying um, 320 here. So this is the most expensive out of the three. And which one makes sense for you um, really depends on the outcomes. This has the highest upward potential. So if you recall, um, one of my favorite presentations I've seen from Tony before I even joined Options Play is the way that he explains covered calls and the optimal strikes by looking at deltas and looking at the differences between upwards movement and probability of, assign, of being assigned or exercised. This is a similar aspect as well, because we have upward momentum and that's what you have to be cognizant of when you're capping your strike prices is which one, how high do I feel the security is going to go and how much am I willing to pay for that? That's the important part. And then we'll go through the risk and outcomes and, and see what happens. All right, um, so started the first outcome with EA just being completely unchanged. So this is the exact same price that the security is before I adjusted um, or when I took the screenshot on the previous slide. What's important for this is some of these we bought with a higher delta, which means it was already in the money. So if it was unchanged and didn't go down, but actually just remained where it was, it didn't lose as much. So if we spend more, so that the cost of these um, are definitely more expensive as we go up. But what we're looking at is the extrinsic value that we purchased versus the actual value at the time versus the cost. So this cost us 566, but the extrinsic value component was 251. What you've noticed from every single one of these is since the underlying security remained exactly the same. That means we are at expiration, which is where extrinsic value completely decays. And that is the exact amount that we lost with every single one of these strategies. So that's the important part to note when you're trying to maybe optimize or minimize that theta decay and choosing a deeper in the money option, you definitely cannot have a short option 
that is in the money as well. That doesn't make any sense. But um, perhaps your long one is a, is a little bit in the money and you still give yourself some upward potential from where the security is. This is the extrinsic value component that decays if the stock doesn't move at all. So the loss is equivalent if you multiply it times 100 to the extrinsic value component. The risk associated with this is this isn't the full loss scenario. I'm just showing you what happened if it was neutral. The risk is as if we were completely incorrect with our directional view and EA went down completely, then we would have had a greater loss on all of these equivalent to our max cost. So 566 here and 635 there. What I showed you was unchanged. So I just wanna make sure that you're not, um, that didn't seem misleading in any way, shape or form. And then our other risk, and this happens anytime you hold an option until assignment, is we have broken spread, um, a broken spread on the day of expiration is what I like to call it. Meaning that part of my option is in the money and something else isn't. Which means, um, if you remember the, the webinar we did on exercise and assignment that goes in great detail, and we're gonna talk about it a little bit at the end, but essentially my 135s, are in the money because buying at 135 is more favorable than the market price of 138, which means since the OCC is going to automatically exercise it, I need to have enough money to buy the 135s or I need to close this entire position to prevent that from happening, which is going to be really difficult with these 150s and the 155 because they're really far out of the money. They're going to have a really wide spread. So they're going to be rather illiquid and it's going to be very, very difficult for me to try to attempt to even close those options. Um, and you're probably not going to be able to close the long option because then you'll end up with the naked option, which normally requires a the highest options level possible and a, a larger margin requirement as well. So it's going to eat up assets of your account until it expires worthless. So that's something to be cognizant of and why it's important to really manage your trades and not hold them till expiration because of that broken spread requirement. But the purpose of this example was just to show you what would happen if the stock didn't move at all and how your losses could be mitigated due to the extrinsic value component and you buying a deeper in the money option for the long leg. And so let's look at what happens when it rallied. So remember, we've got capped upwards potential of 150 and 155. So that's, and we paid the most for our larger directional movement for the 155. So that's important to take note of. We have a gain on every single one of these. Our profit is 691, 934, and 865. This one has more upwards potential, but either way, you can see the percentage returns, and that's that risk to reward ratio that we were talking about earlier that you can certainly take note of, but you had to overcome quite a bit of extrinsic value. To get to this point, we were right. Um, all of these scenarios made money in that directional play, just some made more than others because we had less extrinsic value to overcome. And I think this is a good exercise in looking at just how important reducing risk is in this particular strategy, because notice that strategy on the left-hand side. Even though it has the smallest profit, $691, has by far the largest return on capital. And that large return on capital isn't because it's more profitable, it's because you significantly reduce the cost to get into that specific trade. As you can see, $309 is significantly lower than 566 and 635. And just on that risk reduction alone and that reduction in the amount of capital required to get into the trade, you can significantly improve your return on capital on these types of trades. And that's really an important component of debit spreads is really that reduction in the cost of capital um, even though it has a relatively higher extrinsic value than the strategy in the middle, uh, when you do get the directional view right, sometimes you can see a very high uh, return on capital if you do choose um, a debit spread that reduces the overall risk of the, of the trade itself. So it's really because you know, your return on capital is really two parts. Either you can make a, a large profit in order to see a large return, or you can shrink your uh, risk, if you will. Uh, either two of these relationships are important, but if you can shrink your risk on the on the on the 
denominator, your return will be significantly higher to the upside. So that relationship is really important to understand and I think is an, is an important element to understanding debt and spreads. Yes. Um, and there was one question there that I want to address as far as the far out of the money options, being able to close them for a penny. Um, sometimes you can, sometimes you cannot. You may have to for five cents, but someone has to take the other side of that trade, whether it's a market maker or another person. And I have submitted plenty of cabinet orders in throughout my 13 years, and I have not seen one filled in my entire life. Um, so they're, they're just difficult to close if they're very far out of the money, if they're closer than you may, but if there's zero um, open interest or very, very, very little, it does get really, really difficult. Theoretically, you should, but unfortunately, that's not necessarily the case on the market. All right. All right, so let's look at rallying. Um, so this is where we went above our upper limits. And of course, where we would make the most for the 155 because we had the higher directional view, because we gave ourselves room for more upwards potential. And this is where your price targets are extremely important. Where do you feel the security is going to go and by what time frame, and how much are you willing to pay for it is really the questions I need you to ask yourself when you're trading these types of strategies. And then all of the answers and information that you need to know in order to answer that um, are really on this tool. And that's why it's really helpful just to lay them side by side. Something I use in my trading, especially when I'm trading something like this to understand risk reward and where I feel the security will go. So at this case, we were right in our directional view. We just didn't call the strike price necessarily correctly for the one, the anything with the caps limit of 150. That's okay. Everything was still profitable, um, which is a great thing. It's just this one made the most money because we had more upwards potential. The risk that we have, and just the risks we had before and throughout these examples, is we still have a short option at expiration. This one is at the money, so it's not necessarily going to auto assign because um, it needs to be at 155.01 for that to happen, in which case I need to close this option in order to recognize that profit or otherwise I'm gonna end up with a long position in my account that I'll just end up having to sell at the market. All right, so that actually covered the call side. Um, so we're gonna, like I said before, that four quadrant is gonna be your, your best friend when you're trying to mirror images or understand options holistically. There is always a strategy driver for the single legs where we're going for the long call and the long put. So when we shift into the long puts, just know it's a, it's a mirror. It's literally the exact opposite. Instead of capped upward potential, we're gonna look at capped downwards potential. So we've utilized the exact same example, just flipped it because it is literally a mirror. When you, for the long put um, debit spread, the strategy driver is the long put. That's the most expensive one. So we're going to buy the higher strike and sell the lower strike because we are capping our downwards potential. So just like on the call side where we say, okay, I don't think, I think it's only gonna go this high. We're gonna say, okay, this is how low I feel it's going to go. And then the same rules apply. Um, there is an unlimited reward potential for a long put because the stock can only go to zero, therefore it's substantial. But our risk is the amount that we've paid and we still want strong directional movement. For the debit put spread, just as I said, we just cap our downwards potential. So for the same example, we're saying, okay, I feel like um, Apple is gonna find support at 140. Therefore, this is where I'm gonna go ahead and cap my downwards potential, sell a same amount of calls and the same expiration to make it a true debit spread. It's gonna be at a less price because this is a less valuable put. Selling at 150 is more advantageous than selling at 140. And that's again, why it's a debit spread and why this will always be the driver in this scenario. So in this case, we're risking 340, getting a reward of 660. We still want strong words directional movement, but this time to the strike price of 140. And you can see that also on the profit and loss diagrams. So just the substantial gain potential, we capped our gain potential here. Gains begin at 146.60. Here, gains begin at 145. 
And before we move on to the next slide, I just want to actually address one question that I think is a good question. And I think this slide is a good way for us to also um, tackle that, which is, you know, when do you use a debit spread versus a credit spread? So just to be clear, debit spreads have a positive risk to reward ratio, meaning what you risk versus how much you, you can potentially make is skewed in your favor. You can usually typically make more than what you are risking when you're trading a debit spread. The, the trade-off with that is the fact that the stock needs to move in order for you to be profitable. If you just bought the put option, the stock needs to move below $145 before you see a single penny of gain at expiration. And then the debit spread, while that improves it a little bit, so the stock only has to be below 146.60 before you see a profit at expiration, but the stock still has to move in this particular case at least $3.40 to the downside before you are profitable at expiration. So you should not trade a debit spread unless you believe the stock is going to make a move bigger than $3.40 to the downside in the next 30 days. So typically what I think about using a debit spread, this is usually when the stock has reached a specific price that I think there's a strong chance of reversal that's going to happen fairly quickly. So this is perhaps the stock has rallied in a, in a downtrend, and I think now it's going to continue that downtrend, and that uh, and I expect that price action to happen fairly quickly. Or if there's a catalyst event, such as earnings coming up, is a great example of when you might use a debit spread because you think the stock's going to make a big move in a short amount of time. That's the best time to use a, credit, a debit spread. Credit spreads are more for when you have a neutral or a view where you're not as sure about the, the timing of the trade and the stock doesn't have to move in order to be profitable. So those are the distinct differences between when you need to use a debit spread. I'm not gonna cover deb a credit spreads today, but I will tell you when you need to use a debit spread. So next, let's explore actually choosing the strike prices. So up till now, you know, Jess has referred to selling uh, an option near uh, support or resistance, and that certainly is one way to be fairly tactical about choosing expiration date and strike prices. But if let's say you don't have a specific target price or you don't have a specific um, uh, support or resistance level that you're necessarily targeting from a technical perspective, one of the better ways to choose a strike price uh, on in terms of selling is to use probability based approach, and that's why we use delta. Um, you know, in the uh, so we'll go through the three different um, opportunities here. But the first one, we're basically buying an at the money call, uh, I'm sorry, an at the money put option here on DoorDash, which is trading at 72 uh, and a half. So the 50 Delta is roughly the $75, uh, $75 put option. And we're selling a $65 put option against it. So the 65 strike price is a 30 Delta. That means there's a 30% chance that DoorDash will be below $65 at expiration. Um, the middle strategy, what we have is a slightly in the money option, a $79 strike price, and also selling the $65 strike against it. And the last strategy we have on the right is buying the, uh, the 60 Delta, the $79 strike price, an in the money put option, but we're selling a 20 Delta against it, the $60, $60 strike price. Now, at options play, we typically default to selling roughly the 20 Delta because what we're doing is we're doing a probability-based approach to sell. We're basically saying there's about a 20% chance that the stock will be below $60 at expiration. So 80% of the time, the stock will be above that price. So that's why we're, we're comfortable with capping our potential rewards at that 20 delta price because we're saying that roughly 80% of the time, based on uh, historical pricing or historical volatility, that the stock will not exceed that level. And many times what we'll also show you is that even if the stock does exceed that level, uh, it's still going to take quite a bit below that strike price before it starts to underperform the outright put option. So there's there's a lot that goes into the, you know, I, I know I, we have a lot of choices here on the screen here today, but that's why I want to walk you through each one. But choosing strike prices and expiration dates, there's no one size fits all. There's no best. It's just a matter of what your views are on the underlying stock, how much risk you're willing to take. Uh, and it's a spectrum. And today, hopefully by showing you different risk to reward ratios, different combinations, it gives you a better sense for 
depending on what your views are, how you can go about selecting these for your strike prices. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's see what happens with these outcomes. We'll go through this a, a little more quickly than we did the calls, because again, it's just a mirror image. And thank you for sharing that, Tony. Um, all right, so this time it's, it's a little bit different, and these are actually shorter dated options than the ones before. So I still want you to take a look at the extrinsic value component that is associated with each of these strategies because that's our decaying asset. And as a long option holder, that's something that we want to overcome. So something to be cognizant of. Um, the difference with these strategies that are chosen prior to the earlier ones is every long option is in the money ever so slightly. So therefore, I want to make sure we cover rallied slightly to that at the money point for our first option, the 0.5 delta um, to the Seven, nine, the 79 and 79. So um, we actually are experiencing a loss in every single one of these because this is a directional play and this rallied ever so slightly, but it it wasn't enough to, to help with anything really. Um, so there is a loss with every single one of these because it didn't go in our directional favor. The risk here is if it was to rally even more, we would have a greater loss because some of these are still in the money. The long 79s are in the money. Therefore, that's why they're not at their full trade cost loss. And that's something we have to be cognizant of. Again, like the first example is we've got a broken spread at expiration, which requires trade management because we're going to have to close that out. Otherwise, we're going to end up shorting a security in our account. Because remember, the short side is something that we can't execute exercise instructions again. Those are assigned. So therefore there is risk if we have that. And if you have a long option that's in the money, you've, you've got to close that or we've got to capture value somehow. So that's something that has to be cared for. So now we look at the stock decline. So this moved in our favor, but this moved um, to the 65. So spread one and two, this was a correct directional play. Um, spread three, could have gone a little more. However, all are still profitable and that has to do with the extrinsic value component that was purchased. And by purchasing a long option that's slightly in the money, it allows you to still be profitable on a directional play if it's not fully um, in your favor. And, and, and that's also possible if it's an at the money option as well. The risk reward is extremely important. And again, this has broken assignment. So that's something to be cognizant of because we don't have, it didn't go above 65, so we don't have an offsetting position. So what normally happens on, um, on that expiration Friday, if you have a spread that's fully in the money, it should offset each other. Your long leg, and this includes if you have that ability in your retirement account, your long leg is gonna automatically sell and then your short leg is gonna automatically buy. And then you're going to recognize the exact same gain, maybe, few pennies if you were to close this relatively close to intrinsic value when they're traded. Um, so that's what happens with the auto exercise and assignment process, but it's something that the assignment part is not in your control. And as an options trader, you want to have as much as you can in your control. And that's why it's important to not hold these until expiration and not count on that process because you don't know what that person's offsetting position is and that may not necessarily auto assign. And in this case, it actually wouldn't because it is literally directly on the strike price of 65. Therefore, it, it has to be at least a penny in the money and, and this is not. Um, and someone did make a great point. Yes, generally monies or options that are at the money do expire worthless. Um, that is true because they're not a penny or more in the money. So therefore they don't meet the requirements for the OCC to do the auto, auto exercise assignment process. Um, so now let's look at the scenario where Dash declined all the way to 50, which is past every single lower strike that we've associated with this. So 65, 65, and 60. Our lowest was 60. This went well below. We were right on our directional view, but we weren't right on our capped downwards potential. We still realized maximum profit for every single one of these because we capped our profit at the downward potential that we um, gave ourselves, but we still hold a short option until expiration. Okay. So now let's look at debit spread management really quickly. 
Yeah, this is probably the part that a lot of traders, you know, especially since three quarters of you have traded a debit spread before, you know, there's a lot of questions regarding when do you cut losses, when do you take profits? And there's, I would say, two different schools of thought, and it really depends on how many contracts you have open on a specific strategy. So what I'm going to talk you through first is if you only if you're only trading a single contract, meaning you have to be either all in or all out. The rules are fairly straightforward in managing these types of debit spreads. You generally want to cut losses at 50% of the premium that you have paid. So if you've paid $5 for a debit spread, once you've lost about $2.50 or 50% of what you paid for that debit spread, it's time to cut losses and move on to the next trade. And the reason for this is because if you lose half of the value of the premium that you paid on the debit spread, that generally means that the stock is not going in the direction that you expect it to, and the likelihood of it doing that before the expiration date of the option is fairly unlikely. There's probably about an 85% chance that you will lose the other 50% of the premium that you pay once you lose 50% of the premium. So you're better off saving that 50%, applying it to your next trade, rather than hoping for that 15% chance that you might get yourself back to break even and get yourself out without a loss. So the rule of thumb for cutting losses are fairly straightforward. Now, in terms of taking profits, this really depends on whether or not you have a single contract or you have multiple contracts. Because if you have multiple contracts, the rule of thumb is to at least take partial profits once you've made about 75 to 100% of the premium that you have paid. And you'll generally see those types of uh, returns once the stock reaches the upper or lower strike of uh, or the strike that you've sold on the call or put debit spread. So if you bought a call debit spread, it, once it reaches that upper strike, you're going to see it to perform at about 75 to 100% gain. Now, if you're only trading a single contract, we tend to find the best practices are to simply take the gains and move on to the next trade. However, if you have multiple contracts, the rule of thumb is to take half the position off and leave the other half to potentially co collect the rest of the of the spread. And as Jess was showing you, many times uh, in, in a vertical spread like this, you can look at about 200% uh, percent gain if the stock expires um, you know, at that upper strike or, or lower strike on a put option or on a, on a put debit spread. So in order to collect that 200% gain, you must hold these trades to expiration. But if you hold these trades to expiration, you do risk that 100% gain that you have today might evaporate to, you know, only 50% or even less, or perhaps even a loss. So the way to mitigate that sometimes is to close half the position so that you take some gains off the table, uh, effectively reduce half the risk of the overall trade, and then you still have the other half of the position to try to collect that true 200% max gain. Because like I said, that only happens if you hold it to expiration. So if you're paying $10 for a debit spread, Stop loss is going to happen at $5. And for those of you that have trade with a brokerage firm like Thinkorswim, you can place a bracket order for these types of positions. So you can basically set a stop loss and a take profit in a one cancels the other order so that if the stop loss order gets triggered, it'll cancel the the, the take profit order. And then if the take profit order gets triggered, it cancels your stop loss order. So you can do this um, in, in certain platforms all at once. So if you pay $10 for a debit spread, you set your stop loss at $5 if you, uh, and then set your, your gains at $17.50 to $20 uh, to the upside on a, on a $10 debit spread. So that's really how you can think about using uh, these types of um, uh, metrics, meaning the, uh, a percentage of the premium that you pay to determine when you might want to cut losses and when you might want to take profits. Yes. And to prove that point, I love what happens to gamma when a long call, for example, and a, and a bull call spread, if it blows right through your strike and it goes all the way high. So remember, gamma for a long option is positive and it is normally positive for the bull call spread as well. But when it goes all the way through your higher strike or 120, it actually turns negative. And think about why. 
that's because you no longer can capitalize on directional movement because it's centered around at the money options. So this is going to be your closest to the money if it's if the um, underlying security is above the higher strike. Therefore, you actually need it to just kind of stay where it is or go higher. You cannot afford too much directional movement because now you have risk. Um, so it's a good way to look at the Greeks and how to or when to exit as well. Um, okay, so real quick, because there were actually a couple questions about this is broken spread assignment. And we covered that. I just wanted to give you a little visual about it as far as what happens, just utilizing that evergreen ABC stock and the 100 to 110 and a 105, just for easy math for all of us involved. Um, if you have a long equity call or a bull call spread with a 100 to a 110 and the underlying security lands right in the middle at expiration, you are going to have to auto exercise those unless contrary instructions are submitted and your short call will be difficult to close like we discussed earlier. But what you have to be cognizant of is if your account cannot support this, it's your broker's job to mitigate risk and they do that on your behalf. And that's why it's so important to follow those rules that Tony was talking about, not holding those to expiration because it's very possible that they'll just close these out for you and they'll close it at market and they will get the price that they can to guarantee it so they can just go on to the next account that carries it. So just be very cognizant of that. Remember, keep control of the situation by closing out your options and having an exit strategy. Um, and then the additional risk that's important anytime you have a short call and this a couple of early assignment risk, and this is true with the bull call spread as well, is when there is a dividend on options play, we do populate when there is a next dividend, it's on that strategy checklist as well, which is something very useful to use and we can show you where that is. Um, just know that for the person who is long that option that you're short or, or has a long option um, that you are short, it may be more beneficial for them to exercise those options early in order to capture the dividend and they are required to own the stock the day before the X date. So the day before the X date is the part that you need to be cognizant of. What you're looking for is, is the option priced um, include the dividend amount, if that makes sense. So the actual value of the option plus the dividend, if that is more than what is being priced, then you are very likely to get assigned. And then the last one is surprise assignment. I wanna make sure we cover, cause this happens with Tesla all the time. Um, I think somebody said in there, they got assigned early and this has happened to me as well. Um, just know that you are not out of the water on expiration day because there is this hour and a half um, or hour and 15 minutes if you're, you're trading broad-based ETFs where the long option holder can submit exercise instructions to the OCC. And so your option may be expired and then it's not trading anymore. But in this case, um, if you had a short Tesla 1060 call and just pulled it up on a chart back in the end of December, where it closed at 1056, you might've thought my short call is not gonna get assigned, I am okay. But in the post-market session, it jumped really, really high. The only way that the person who holds that long option is able to capitalize on that movement is by submitting exercise instructions if that happens before 5.30. And that's something that happens. You'll end up shorting something in your account and then that's gonna be a really big loss because you didn't have an offsetting position. So be cognizant of post-market activity if you have something with a really high beta, meaning it moves quite a bit. Um, and it, it closes very close to the money on expiration Friday. So again, I apologize, I'm saying it so much. You've got to make sure that you have those best practices and close out your options when they hit your exit strategy on the up or downward side. Yeah. Um, generally speaking, debit spreads, you want to close them out before expiration is the, is the message that we're trying to, to send here, regardless of whether it's a profit or a loss, whether you think you've made the full profit, whether you've made partial profits, best practices are to look at managing these trades before expiration, closing them a day or two if you're near that max profit level before expiration. Um, and especially if you are beyond the, the max profit or um, beyond the upper strike or, or the lower strike, depending on the call or put, to close those out before expiration to avoid all of these different edge cases that could 
uh, result in a fairly different outcome than you had originally expected to when you entered a debit spread. So with that, that covers what we wanted to share with you here today. For you to access the platform that automates finding these debit spreads for you, um, you can find them. You can sign up for a free 30-day trial at optionsplay.com. And what I do want to spend is just a couple of minutes in showing you kind of how to navigate the Options Play platform that allows you to, uh, you know, test out these different scenarios and, and play with them and use, uh, you know, the paper trading feature that we have here at Options Play to allow you to do this before we open this up for a Q&A. So I'm just going to take over screen share here for one second. Um, and I want to share with you the Options Play tool. This is the tool that Jess was showing you before the screenshot that she had sh that she was looking at. And then we have this PL simulator here at the bottom, so that regardless of what strategies you set up here up top, you can set your uh, directional view on the underlying stock and see how that strategy will perform side by side. Those are the profit and return levels that she was referring to here before. And our platform will actually uh, automatically select the debit spread with specific expiration dates and strike prices automatically for you, depending on whether you choose you're bullish on the underlying stock or if you're bearish on the underlying stock. So if we're looking at electronic arts and you're thinking to yourself, this stock has rallied substantially here over the past few uh, weeks, maybe it's time that it's going to see a bit of a pullback here and you want to take a bit of a contrarian view and you want to take a look at a bearish spread, we will actually find the optimal uh, spread for you to trade to, as a starting point. Now, optimal means that based on pr a probability-based approach, I, I saw a question here before, why don't we use standard deviations to choose strike prices? And the answer is that we do. That's how we chose the 125 strike price to sell against the 142 strike price that we purchased because the 125 is that one standard deviation move. We do take a probability-based approach. And then you can then see if the stock makes a directional move you expect it to, how much potential gain do you have? And you can even use the, um, uh, the tool to create different put verticals. Perhaps instead of looking at 142, 145, maybe you want to look at a 142, 135 and see how these two strategies perform side by side. And you can use the P&L simulator to see, okay, if the stock makes that decline to, let's say, that 128 level, which is the resistance level from before it broke out, well, how much potential gain do you have? You can see these strategies side by side and compare them and see what your potential risk and what your potential rewards are between any two strategies. And we encourage you, try out different combinations. You know, what you're going to see, and I, I wanna answer one of the questions here, which is, you know, what is the recommended risk to reward ratio? I wanna walk you through kind of the different variations and kind of what, uh, what we typically look for when we're looking at a risk to reward ratio on this type of strategy. But before I do, I just wanna show you, you can click on the trade button for any of the strategies that you're viewing here within Options Play, and you can uh, paper trade these in, uh, in Options Play. You can add these positions to your paper trading portfolio and track these positions in your portfolio tool. I encourage you to use the Manage button here on your portfolio tool to set up your live accounts, a paper trading portfolio. You can set up as many portfolios as you want. I have ones for my different live accounts. I have ones for paper trading, and I can simply look at my paper trading account and just uh, look at the positions that are currently in my paper trading account. And I can see this electronic arts 142, 135 put spread that I have put on, and I can track this as time goes on. It's a great way for those of you, the 25% of you that said that you're brand new to, to, um, uh, to debit spreads, to try things out without risking any real capital paper trade it for the next 30 days if you're trying options play for the first time. Um, and make sure you understand your risk or rewards and look through different scenarios uh, and make sure you understand these strategies before you go ahead and place that trade. So with that, that covers what Jess and I wanted to share with you here today. Um, what I want to do is spend a little bit of time answering your questions here. So there's a Q&A window and a chat window. If you can please type your questions that you have for Jess and I into the Q&A window, we will answer as many questions as we have time for here today before we have to sign off. So 
Kevin asked a question here. What is the recommended risk to reward ratio? So Kevin, uh, you know, I would say in the, in the world of options, there's never a recommended one because it really depends on what your views are and what your objectives are. So when I looked at this put vertical here before, uh, let, me, uh, let, let me go back to electronic arts just to make this uh, easier to, to review. And we're going to look at that bearish spread that I was looking at before. We'll compare the two side by side. But we're looking at the 142.135 and the 142.125. We'll look at these two uh, side by side. And what you're going to see here is that in the 142.135, you have a, a far more balanced risk to reward ratio. You have a max risk of 300, a max reward of 400 versus uh, the, the, the ones with the, the, the wider debit spread, you're risking 633 to potentially make uh, 1067. So when you see a risk to reward ratio that's closer to one to one, like the one you have here in the middle, the, the, the trade-off that you have there is that you have very little extrinsic value, meaning not much time decay. And sometimes you even have positive time decay. Sometimes in a debit spread, if you use a kind of a debit spread that has a one-to-one -one risk reward ratio, you either have very little time decay or no time decay. And the benefit there is that the stock doesn't have to move in order for it to, it, 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 the, the stock doesn't have to move in a quick and a short amount of time before you can see profits. It can move slowly over the period of the, uh, between now and expiration and see that profit uh, similar to being short the stock rather than uh, you know long an option where you need to have a big move before it's profitable. When you have a strategy that's more uh, two to one risk to reward ratio, you're going to have a higher extrinsic value, meaning the stock has to move in a relatively short amount of time before that strategy is profitable. So that's a trade-off that you make between the two. One is not necessarily better, better than the other. It's dependent on what your outlook on the underlying stock is uh, to determine what the best risk to reward ratio is for you. Um, Williams asks, well, can one side of a spread be assigned or do both sides have to close together? I think we've kind of covered a lot of these different scenarios with broken spreads. But again, the, the, sum, the summation of that is you generally want to manage these before expiration so that you avoid these assignment issues or concerns that you might have. Yep. I remember only your short option can be assigned. The long one is on you or your brokerage firm can do it on your behalf. Um, I really love Amita's question on, could you explain the connection between volatility and whether or not a debit spread makes sense? Um, so volatility should not be confused with implied volatility. Those are two very different things. Um, remember long options have a positive vega, which means they have a um, vega exposure and they benefit from movement that equates to risk on the short option side. So you want a higher implied volatility on something that you're selling, so you capitalize premium, but that's not the driver of the strategy. You can benefit from movement because you want a large directional play. Um, so there, there are certainly differences there. And that's why options play is helpful when it has those optimized strategies, it's gonna filter that out for you. Yeah, and, and there was a, there were a couple of questions regarding you know how do you see the Greeks and you know how do you combine option Greeks? So first of all, in terms of option Greeks, you can see them simply by looking at the strike dropdown. So when you're choosing your strike prices, you can choose them based on the deltas. You have your strike price, you have your premium, and then you have the delta on the strike dropdown. We also have the one standard deviation marks on these dropdowns. So for those of you that are looking for uh, how do I quickly find the one standard deviation strike, you can do so by clicking on the strike dropdown and the one standard deviation will be marked depending on the strike price. So for example, I can I know the one standard deviation move higher on electronic arts is somewhere between 155 and 160 and the one standard deviation move lower is somewhere between 125 and 130. Um, so this is designed to help you quickly find the exact strike price that you want to buy or sell, especially if you think of them in kind of standard deviation terms. And the question about, you know, how do you combine option Greeks? Is it simple math? And the answer is yes. If you have a 60 delta option that you're buying and you're selling a 30 del del delta option that you're uh, uh, 30 delta option that you're selling, your net delta is 30 deltas. It's just simple arithmetic. And that works across all of the Greeks.
Mm -hmm. uh, I already answered the question regarding debit versus credit spreads, Mark. So hopefully that answered your question before. What factors determine whether you roll out your spread? Um, so I would love to get your opinion on this one too, Tony. Um, we may it may vary, so full disclosure there. Um, but it it really depends on my sentiment. So I would utilize those best practices that we have. So if I'm at a hundred percent profit potential, and I still feel like there's more upwards momentum, in which case I may roll it out farther and may roll it up. Um, or if I'm on the downside, but I still feel like there's upward potential and perhaps my timing is wrong, you could roll at that point, but you have to be extremely important and cognizant of how much extrinsic value you are capitalized or, or you are paying as you roll debit spreads. Um, rolling is something I think I do more with credit spreads, um, but it's just extremely important with debit spreads when you have those directional movements that you allow yourself more upward potential for what you're rolling to, taking into account what you purchased on the original strategy. Yeah, the general rule of thumb for debit spreads, you know, in terms of rolling is when it's reached, so for example, if let's say I'm buying this 155, 135 put vertical on Apple uh, and it expires here in July 22nd, but let's say, you know, over the next few days, some bad news comes out and the stock quickly reaches 135. Um, and I still have plenty of time left. And I think there was a question here earlier, uh, or earlier I saw on the queues and what to do when things are very volatile and you kind of reach your target prices very quickly. You know, that's a scenario where you might want to roll a position because once it reaches the upper, you know, in this particular case, the lower strike very quickly, and I still have plenty of time left to go, I've made about 100% gain on the underlying position. And perhaps at that point, your views have changed even further, right? So before you thought the stock can reach 135, but now that it's reached 135 quickly, maybe you think the stock can continue to move lower. So only in the scenario where your views have changed and you've become even more bearish, that's a great time to roll because you can lock in your profits. You can lock in basically 100% gain on the trade itself use the proceeds to buy a new spread. And you're effectively at that point, as some people call it, playing with house money. You're no longer risking any of your capital to play for further downside. And you've locked in your, your, your profits so that even if that trade, that second trade doesn't work out, you're not risking any additional capital to do so. So it's usually when you exceed your expectations faster than you were expecting to, that's a good time to roll those positions. Um, there's a question with the Amazon put debit spread from the daily play options play. I had an early assignment. Could you explain what we should do in case we have an early assignment on a debit spread? Um, you know, that depends on whether or not I, I would assume that many times in that particular case, you may not have had the cash to purchase the 100 shares of Amazon. Uh, first of all, your brokerage firm may close out your, your um, equity position fairly quickly in that scenario. Um, you know, Jess, I don't know if you have any insights or thoughts in, in terms of what you do there, but generally speaking, I would close out the equity position if you don't intend on having that equity position or over assigned early. Yeah, depends on how you feel about it. Maybe sell calls against it, but that's a, a large position. I wouldn't make sure it doesn't account for too much of my portfolio as well. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, Alex is saying, how, how should the OP score be used? Great question. So the, uh, you know, in my experience, it doesn't correlate with outcome. So let's just be clear. The options play score is not telling you what the outcome of, of potential, uh, potential profit is. What the options play score is telling you how well balanced the risk to reward of a strategy is. As you can see, different strategies have risk to reward ratios that are all over the place. Right. So, uh, for example, I can potentially make fifteen thousand dollars with unlimited risk. I can make fourteen thousand dollars for nine hundred and twenty dollars worth of risk or I can make uh, twelve hundred dollars for seven hundred and thirteen dollars worth of risk. How do you compare these three strategies from a risk to reward perspective? The answer is you can't. 
And, and that's why we created the options play score to give you a better sense for how well balanced the risk reward strategies are for each of these three, three strategies. What it doesn't tell you is whether or not Apple will move lower and in order for you to be profitable from that. Because you know, in order for any of these three strategies to be profitable, Apple has to move lower. Now, the options play score is not accounting for direction. It's not a, a, you know, predicting whether the stock's going to move lower or higher. You are making that decision. But if the stock does move lower, which one of these three strategies will give you a better risk to reward ratio over the long run? If every single time you have a bearish view, you take a, a specific strategy, the strategy on the right hand side will give you a better risk to reward ratio in the long run, um, assuming that you are correct on your directional view. So the options play score is not telling you whether or not you're going to be profitable. It's saying that if you are if you are correct in your directional view, which strategy gives you the better risk to reward ratio? So hopefully that gives you a better understanding of the um, uh, of the options play score. Um, Mike, your question, your point about trading is an infinite game need to manage losses. Absolutely. Um, and for those of you that don't know what Mike's referring to, I, I encourage you to watch one of my videos, um, on, 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 uh, managing, uh, losses and managing positions. Uh, it's an incredibly insightful shift in how you view, uh, trading, um, and something that I plan on doing another session on re relatively recently, uh, relatively soon. And I hope many of you will be able to join me because we've recently launched some new tools here with an options play that are designed to help you manage losses and manage getting into positions that cause big losses to begin with. Uh, yes, we do send messages when to close daily plays. Yesterday, we sent out two closing uh, trades yesterday. So um, yes, you do get um, opening and closing signals from us. Do you ever hold options till expiration, either at max profit or max loss? Um, occasionally, Daniel, we do, but I would say not frequently do we hold options positions to expiration. You know, Jess, I think you had the statistic up in one of the previous sessions that we did about close to three quarters of options positions are closed before expiration. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's 70%. That's really high. Yeah. Um, there's a, I know when I talked about bracket orders, there were a few questions from different people about placing bracket orders. Now, not many brokers from support bracket orders on option spreads. So you, you're going to have to ask your specific brokerage firm as to whether or not they um, allow OCO orders or one cancel other orders on an option spread. I trade with Thinkorswim. It's one of the few platforms that do provide bracket orders on uh, a, an option spread. And it really allows me to um, manage risk on both sides on profit and loss. Uh, but I will say that, you know, bracket orders are not necessarily set and forget, you know, you still have to think about um, uh, whether a stock is going to move in a specific direction, especially when you get a big gap before the open. Sometimes it makes sense to remove that bracket order and kind of work that order after the market opens after a big move. So, you know, they're not a, a fail safe. They're not a complete fail safe way to protect yourself. But sometimes in a fast moving market intraday, it could just be it could mean the difference between uh, cutting losses or taking profits um, before you've had time to look at your computer screen. Um, new, a question about new platform does not show probability of the trade. It does. Um, it's still here. The probability of profit is still here on the new platform. Um, that was a question from Jake. Mm -hmm. How important is options volume when picking a stock to use the strategy? So Rob, um, you know, we don't look at options volume so much. What we look at is the size of the bid ask spread. Um, the size of the bid ask spread is far more important, and you don't have to do that analysis because we do that analysis for you here within Options Why You just type in your symbol, and we will show you the liquidity of that symbol. Um, 
So you can very easily get a sense for whether you're going to have an easy time getting filled on the order. So uh, when something that's very liquid, I will almost always place my order at the midpoint and I will generally see a fill within one or two pennies of that midpoint for the most part for anything very liquid. If you're looking at something that's not as liquid, I think EA is probably not as liquid or somewhat liquid. Uh, EA is liquid. Um, let's see, what's a less liquid name? I'm trying to think of one. <laughs> so for example, uh, Zillow Group is not liquid. So when I'm placing a trade here, um, you know, I'll place it at the midpoint, but I know that if I'm buying, I might have to go uh, maybe four or five cents off the midpoint, sometimes maybe even as high as 10 cents off the midpoint before I get filled. So liquidity just, just, just determines how easily you'll get filled at the midpoint or how close you get filled to the midpoint. The less liquid something is, the more likely you're going to have to put in a price or a loan order that's a little bit further away from the midpoint before you get filled. But you know, look at the liquidity indicator. That's a far better, far better sense for whether or not you're going to get filled than options volume. Um, Michael's asking, how does options play analytically determine whether debit or credit spreads is the right trade? So I wouldn't say that there's a single metric that you can use for that, but IV rank is certainly one place that you can start with. So when IV rank is above 50, uh, you know, it, it gen as a generalization, and this is a big generalization to make, but generally speaking, when the higher the implied volatility is, the better perhaps a credit spread might be uh, for your specific strategy. The lower the IV rank is on a specific stock, perhaps the better a debit spread is going to be. So bullish or bearish debit spreads, or if you're looking for high implied volatility, the credit spreads, so we have both the bullish credit spread as well as the bearish credit spread um, here. So if you had to look at a single metric, I would say IV rank is the place to go. But if you really dig a little deeper, it get, it's a little bit more nuanced than that. A uh, great question about what is the strength score? So the strength score is the relative strength of the underlying stock. And what we do is we rank all stocks from a score of one to 10. One are, and you can sort your watch list or trade ideas. So if you're looking at a watch list, you can sort your watch list based on strength, um, which is going to sort, for example, if I'm looking at communications, I can see which stocks are the weakest stocks in the communications sector, like Facebook and, and Netflix, which stocks are the strongest stocks in, in the communications sector, like uh, EA, uh, AT&T, Activision, Blizzard. Um, this gives me a sense for which stocks are underperforming the market or which stocks are outperforming the market. I can dive it dive into uh, from an overall market perspective, or I can look into an individual sector. And this is really one of the more powerful um, tools within options play, because I can look at just all the sector spiders and sort it by strength. So I can see that um, consumer discretionary is the weakest sector here. And the strongest sector is energy and utilities. And they're color coded, coded based on the trend as well. So I can see the trend of the, of the sector as well as the relative strength. And I can dive into individual sectors or I can even look at things like, you know, upcoming earnings, you know, what stocks have the highest strength of upcoming earnings, what stocks have the lowest strength. This is something I sort through when I'm looking for opportunities in the market is looking at relative strength. So it really just shows you which stocks are outperforming the market and which stocks are underperforming the, the market and giving you a metric as to how extreme that out or underperformance is. Do you have those implied? Oh, go ahead. <laughs> same, same question. Happy for you to take that. Oh yeah, you're so quick. Um, how does implied volatility affect strike selection? I'm sure you're going to talk about implied volatility rank too, so I'll, I'll let you take that one. Um, but it makes your options more expensive. If there's a higher implied volatility, it's a component of the options premium. So remember, um, I keep referring to old videos there, all on our YouTube channel, but a piece of the options premium is made of intrinsic value and extrinsic value. Extrinsic is time and implied volatility. So that implied volatility, if it's high, will make your option more expensive, which could, um, if you're playing earnings, for example, that's a, a really common thing 
for people to do is, is buy calls and puts before earnings and they experience volatility crush. And that's due to the high, high implied volatility because the market expects a really big directional move in either direction. And therefore the options reflect that price. Um, so it makes them more expensive or less expensive if it has a lower implied volatility and you don't necessarily look at it. There's not necessarily a benchmark for implied volatility in general. It's really for that security. And that's why IV rank is extremely important, which I'll let Tony talk about. Yeah, so IV rank is really just looking at the implied, the current implied volatility of, of an option relative to its own history. Now, it's important to understand that it's a generalization of, of implied volatility. What we're looking at is the 30-day at the money in implied volatility. Now, the problem is that you're not necessarily trading the 30-day at the money implied volatility. So it's not always the, the most important metric because unless you're trading the 30-day at the money option, um, it's not necessarily representative of what you're trading. So for example, if you're selling a 10-day, I don't know, 10% out of the money option, the IV rank may not be representative of what where implied volatility actually is for the option that you're, you're buying or selling. And that's why I have a problem with the IV rank, even though we use it as a kind of a metric, it's not a, a one size fits all metric that you can use to say, okay, now's a great time to buy debit spreads or now's a great time to sell credit spreads. It's a, it's a generalization of what implied volatility looks like today. Um, so, uh, you know, we are stretching our time here. So I will do a quick rapid fire of a few remaining questions that I see here. Um, what are the best historical deltas for long and short? Generally speaking, the best deltas for long is about 50 to 60 delta and short is about uh, 15 to 20 delta. Um, don't you have a 21 day rule? That only applies to credit spreads, Michael. That does not apply to debit spreads. Um, is there a way to filter out symbols that are very liquid? So we are working on that. So that is something that is something that you can currently do in trade ideas. If you go to expand, um, you can see the liquidity star. So you can actually sort through the, um, uh, the ideas based on liquidity. So you can see Airbnb, very liquid. Uh, um, you know, Alcoa, not very liquid. So you can sort through the trade ideas list and see which ones are very liquid and which ones are not very liquid. And, you know, the one thing that you might notice when you go through this is that the vast majority of symbols are not very liquid. And, and that's the reality of options trading. Out of 5,000 optionable symbols, only about two to 300 are truly liquid. The rest of the 4,800 uh, symbols are not very liquid. Um, do you also consider IV rank in addition to Delta to avoid volatility crush? Yes, it is something that we do consider uh, and it's something that we use to help determine whether we're, our preference is to buy or sell options. Um, so with that, that covers what we have time for here today. I do want to uh, thank everyone for taking the time out here this afternoon. I hope that this was helpful in giving you a better understanding of debit vertical spreads, which is uh, an important uh, strategy for the um, for our trading here at, at uh, Options Play, and hopefully a strategy that you will also use in your portfolio. I am very excited to be coming back here soon to talk about credit spreads uh, because it is also a very important topic uh, and a strategy that we use very much. So with that, thank you so much. Um, I hope you guys have a great trading day and Jess, I'll let you sign off and we'll, we'll end the session here. Talk to everyone soon. Thank you.